Hi folks, today we're going to be talking about work and family. So uh, this is chapter 11 in our text. Uh, we begin with talking about and discussing several themes. First of which includes the growing influence of the market and state. And so we're talking really about the economy and government, the growing influence of both of these on families. We're also looking at a theme of work moving, uh, particularly work that was traditionally reserved for women at home into the marketplace. We're also looking at the tension between paid work and family obligations. And so that's a big, big overarching theme within the chapter. We're also looking at themes that involve macro social and macro rather economic trends. Uh, so we're looking at uh, with that, with macro social and macro economic trends and themes, we're looking really at widespread social and economic conditions. And so uh, this includes a number of things. For instance, uh, the pandemic that we're experiencing right now, in addition to unemployment, underemployment, all of these greatly impact how family-based work is accomplished within society. In fact, the pandemic we understand, and this is coming from a recent report from the Brookings Institution, the research that they've done shows that the pandemic has disproportionately impacted working women who are concentrated in lower paying face-to-face -face work that's deemed essential work. And so a lot of this work has been subject to layoff or women in those occupations often have to quit so that they can be home with children as schools and childcare facilities have shut down so that we can stop the community spread of the virus. Also, work and family conflict. So with that, we're talking about a number of things. Uh, we're looking largely at the cultural shift of women's employment uh, as well as men's resistance to care work and housework. And so that combination of women uh, in very large, uh, incredible numbers over a short period of time joining the labor force along with men's resistance to care work in straight relationships, uh, that together conjoined has contributed to conflicts between family and paid work obligations. Now we need to talk about some relevant types of work and so we're going to talk about some, some concepts uh, related to work and families and so with that we're looking at care work as well as housework. And so with care work, we're looking at person-to-person -person labor that's intended to increase the capabilities of another. And so we're looking here at uh, occupations and industries like early childhood education, social work, and workforce development. And so these are all, in addition to industries and occupations, these are all parts of Mott Community College with respect to different departments and different initiatives that the college has. Now, funding for care work may come from, and often does, come from multiple sources, including fee for services, as well as grants from government tax revenues. Also within work types, we're looking at housework. And so this is work intended to maintain the functions of a household, including yard work, repairs, shopping, and paying bills. Now, increasingly, uh, both care work and housework are accomplished at some level outside of the family itself in a number of professional and paraprofessional settings and occupations. So in addition to care work and housework, we also have to talk about market work. And so market work, we're looking really at labor done by employees for pay. Now, again, we're looking at the shifting of the majority of women into paid work outside of the home, having taken place in very, very dr dramatic and large fashion since the 1960s. Combined with care work and housework, market work accomplishes a system of care. So with that, we're looking at the process of accomplishing family-based labor for society. Now, there are challenges to this system of care that we've just mentioned. So one of the challenges, in addition to the opportunities, is, well, who does what? And so this really concerns how labor is distributed within the family amongst its members. And so we're also talking about what fashion this distribution of labor occurs in. Is this something that happens cooperatively in the family amongst its members, or does it happen within tension or having some kind of conflict? And so in a way, this kind of you know harkens back to functional theory and conflict theory as we talked about those and how they describe much of not only the sociological approach, but how we really look at, if you will, interactions between people and groups within society. Now, 
in terms of the question of who does what with respect to the system of care, much of this process, it, it's mediated by or influenced by social structures, including uh, those concerning career, gender, race, class, culture, and mass media. And so all of these things, who we are in terms of race and ethnicity and culture, who we are in terms of our social class, the mass media messages that we ultimately have to digest, be it, they, be it they come from social media or even commercials, all of those sort of impacts our sense within our families of who should do what kind of work. Also, families have to think about it in terms of uh, do it, doing things yourself or doing, do it yourself, I should say. Families have to go that route. They have to think about the do-it-yourself route versus outsourcing a lot of the work. And so this is often determined by discretionary budgets. Families have to think of, well, how much money do we have left over after all the bills and necessities are taken care of? And so they, within this, determine whether and how often to prepare or buy meals, style their hair at home or at a salon, or again, how much yard work and maintenance that they uh, can do on their own, or perhaps, again, hiring somebody else to do it. And also, child care is also another opportunity and challenge to that system of care that we're, we're talking about as well, uh, in that uh, we can also do it ourselves and we can also outsource child care. And so this is also something that's determined by how much money is left over once everything that we need to do is done. So we determine whether or not to seek formal early childhood ed education versus homeschooling, for instance, or uh, whether or not we'll use a family member as a babysitter versus a website uh, like Care.com. And I'm sure you've probably all seen commercials for uh, the service that Care.com offers. Now, we also, and we've talked about this at least briefly, uh, discussed uh, changes in paid labor. And we're really looking at changes that have occurred within the United States in paid labor over the past 60 to 70 years. So women's transitions to paid labor is chief among these. And so this occurred later than that for men, especially after 1960. And so the shift of women to paid labor occurred in three stages. Number one, single women entered the labor force. So they were really the first, if you will, in mass to do so. After single women married, Women without children, childless women, entered the labor force disproportionately in large numbers. And then three, uh, coming after all those, uh, you're looking at most married women with children entering the labor force last or more recently as an aggregate. Among women, those who are college educated have the highest labor force participation. So again, it makes sense, uh, the effort that they have put into going to college, graduate study, uh, professional schooling and so forth is in a sense paid back or paid off by going into paid labor. Uh, the rapid increase in female labor force participation has contributed to unclear expectations for women, work, and families. And so there are, and the book talks about this, a number of questions that women may be beset with. And often we see this happening across communities and institutions and society in terms of, well, how much should a woman or how much should I be working, a woman may wonder, at different points throughout her life, uh, not just across the board. And so uh, the very rapidity, the speed within which women have joined uh, the paid labor force over the past 60 to 70 years has really ultimately contributed to those kinds of questions. We also have to look within changes in paid labor at labor market segmentation. And so much of the work that happens in our society, be it in the family or outside, is very sex segregated. And so the very sex segregated na nature of our occupations, uh, the fact that men tend to do one kind of thing and women tend to do another kind of thing within the labor force, that actively contributes to the acceptability of women working. And so women are much more likely to work in uh, occupations that involve care work. And care work has been traditionally defined as female or feminine. And so there's been, in a sense, less conflict uh, with in mass women coming into the labor force because of that. And so again, we're still looking at, if we're looking at, for instance, fields like construction, engineering, for instance, uh, the vast majority of those workers tend to be male. If we're looking at uh, a lot of our medical professions, particularly nursing, dental hygiene, if we're looking at early childhood education, social work, we're looking at fields that again are very care work based 
and are disproportionately, if you will, staffed by women. And so that in and of itself, that divide does contribute, if you will, uh, to the acceptability of women working. Uh, but at the same time within that, there's also tension and conflict as well. All right. All right. Going on. Uh, if we're looking, for instance, at housework, uh, including child care, for instance, uh, time use studies uh, have given us significant data and significant feedback. Uh, the data indicate that married women have cut their housework by roughly half during the past 50 years. And so, again, as you can imagine, that tracks very similar. It's, uh, if you will, tracking similarly with women's or with female labor force participation. Married men have also doubled, if you will, their housework. With the difference now between the sexes in straight relationships at less than two to one female to male doing more housework uh, than men. And so we're looking at more egalitarian, if you will, aspects with respect to housework in terms of straight relationships. Still, however, women are doing more than men and are expected to do more than men. Nevertheless, the changes we've seen in terms of housework and child care are due to a few factors. Number one, uh, overall, the shifting ratios, if you will, the balance has shifted, but also the total time spent on housework by married couples has declined. And there is significant, if you will, movement of care work to the marketplace. And so, again, now we can offload and outsource a lot of the work that was formerly traditionally done within the family by its members we can shift and offload a lot of that to the market itself. And so this would involve a number of things like we had talked about before, but in addition to uh, a lot of what we had talked about in terms of, uh, say, care.com, for instance, we're also looking at, uh, be it Mary Maids, or we're looking at uh, any number, for instance, of food purveyors, any number of restaurants, if you will, that uh, will gladly help us out at home and provide us a home-cooked meal. Now, consistent with the involved father ideal discussed in prior chapters, uh, both men and women have increased their time with children. So that is something that we see also, again, as we have approached uh, systemically more egalitarian values. However, research shows that women are still doing more overall in terms of care work as well as ordinary housework. Uh, if you will, number one, uh, the partner with the greater obligations away from the home and typically in straight relationships, we're looking at men having greater obligations outside the home. So the partner with those greater obligations outside the home tends to do less housework and less child care due technically to having less time available. Also, the research shows partners with greater personal resources, and these tend to be men in straight relationships. They tend to do less housework and less child care. Uh, and so that partner who has the greatest earnings controls more resources within the family and often has more power within the relationship and also gender socialization. And so how we're socialized as men and women, we see that passed down from one generation to the next. Uh, and so our own familial experiences inform a lot of how we end up doing the care work and the housework within our society. And again, much of those even having shifted to the market still is very gendered in and of itself. Now we have to also look at demographics and social groups. And so uh, research shows that there indeed are gender differences in childcare and housework. Um, but again, that they are mediated by religion, race and ethnicity, as well as sexual orientation. So uh, for instance, uh, we understand that for a lot of uh, folks who are fundamentalist Christian, uh, that they often hew to much more traditional, if you will, values placed on women doing more of the care work and housework within those kinds of familial environments. Regardless, the division of labor in the home, although it's unequal, it's often justified by couples to minimize the conflict within the relationship or the conflict within the marriage. Now, we have talked a lot about married people and partnered people, but not as much about single mothers. And so the research indicates that, uh, as you can imagine, single mothers experience the most severe work family conflicts that there are. And a lot of this also owes itself to the feminization of poverty. And so we talked about that poverty being disproportionately uh, a woman's experience. And so that feminization 
you know, again, where we're paying lower wages to women uh, and we often expect and have a greater expectation and there are greater burdens for women taking care of children. Uh, these are predictors of such sort of work family conflict. Now, this contrasts pretty sharply with the experiences of single fathers. And so single fathers, the research shows, uh, tend to have higher earnings than single women. Uh, single mothers, they tend to have life partners. And when fathers are single, they are much more likely to have older children around to lessen their burdens. Again, so uh, even looking within the notion of single parenthood, we can also observe inequality. Uh, in this chapter, we can also talk about the so-called motherhood penalty versus the so-called fatherhood premium. And so that's one of the issues that we have as well, uh, if you will, that families are grappling with. Research shows that women earn less if they have children, even taking work experience into account. While conversely, fathers earn more than men who aren't fathers, partly because the labor and the support of their wives helps them to get ahead at work. And so this disparity, uh, there's no real reason for it than simple gender inequality and gender stratification, right? All right, we also can talk about the Family and Medical Leave Act. So we've had this Family FMLA Act. It's been around since 1993, almost 30 years. And so it's a federal act that entitles workers to roughly three months of unpaid leave due to illness, the need to take care of family members, per a birth, adoption, or an, or an illness. So this was a rare, rare sort of action taken by the federal government and was a significant acknowledgement and intervention uh, to or within the challenge of work-life conflict. And so it's a good thing to have, however, it does come with its challenges. And so this FMLA-based leave is unpaid, so it often is unaffordable. Where it is affordable, workers may technically be taking advantage of sick days using those sick days that they've accrued at their job as pay. So a lot of folks, of course, don't get sick pay in copious amounts or get any at all. Also, roughly half of American workers are not covered because of the exemptions to the FMLA Act itself. And those who are covered, they tend to have higher paying, more family friendly kinds of workplaces. So the, it sort of cushions the blow, if you will, when they're away from uh, the workplace. Also, many employers are openly reluctant for employees to take the leave, despite the fact that they have the legal mandate and a cultural mandate to do so, right? Now, the book also talks about a number of strategies, things that we can do to reduce work and family conflict. Number one, we can reduce, we could in mass as a society reduce work hours. This may seem drastic, workers in the U.S. already work longer hours than our European counterparts. And those workers have been deemed more productive, that they get more done more efficiently according to comparative studies of labor economics. And so the idea that, well, working more allows you to do more work in a more efficient way is definitely something that can be challenged and is challenged by the data. Also, one way that we can reduce work conflict is to provide greater flexibility. Uh, flex time is something that you hear talked about and bandied about a lot more. It is more common today as a reducer of work-life conflict, yet it's often, again, associated with those higher paying, if you will, occupations that we deem as careers. It may benefit employers more, ironically, who can expect or even demand workers to uh, work on weekends and into the evenings. One thing we can also see that could reduce work family conflict would be if there's family support from employers. So if there's true dedicated time off for family care, um, at the same time, research shows that at this point, typically taking advantage of such uh, often hurts career advancement. And so that's where the rub lies. And we've got to find a way to recognize that people, um, these are real lives, not abstractions. And again, they have a life outside of work and that they're not owned, if you will, by the workplace. One thing that we can do is certainly degendering. Um, as discussed in the context of egalitarian familial approaches for African Americans and Native Americans, uh, reducing a strict adherence to traditional gender roles, it not only works, 
partners will gain quality time and they will reduce their work-life conflict.